Welcome to the uh, Beacon Business to Business webinar. This is the second in a series. Our host today is Mark Johnson. He's going to be talking about the predictive index. All we hear about today in management and leadership circles is transformation, digital transformation, organizational transformation. And this is a tool to help leaders make sure those transformations are going well and that they will succeed because at the heart of everything are people. And if we don't get the people right, it's hard to expect great outcomes from whatever we do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and uh, this is gonna be interactive. Mark, do you want questions during or after your presentation? Interactive, please. Great. Uh, you, please. If you would all put your contact information in the chat box as we go, that way everybody will get everything in one place. We're gonna send out a list of who was on the call afterwards, but if you would put it in the chat box, that would be great. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you very much, Charlie. Appreciate the uh, thank you the intro. And thanks to everybody who came out early on a Monday morning to, uh, to listen to this. I appreciate it. There we go. So here's our agenda. I'm gonna start off with an offer that I'm gonna to make to everybody on this, on this call. And Rip, I've moved you up. Rip is going to give us a little case study. He actually uh, implemented some of the uh, techniques that we're talking about this morning. So Rip's going to give us a little feedback on that. Then I have a very brief interview, or sorry, overview of predictive index. And then we're going to do a, a real life uh, behavioral assessment readback, just as if I were reading it back to a client. Rich Richardson, who's on the call, has kindly agreed to... Uh, to let us appear into his life and appear into his personality and his drives and, and share that so you can get a taste for what a readback is all about and the insights that you get from it. Then I'm gonna show you a team assessment tool and then we'll discuss next steps. Does that work for everybody? All right. So I'm calling this a speed to value offer to you. And here's my offer to everybody on this call. And the reason I'm calling it speed to value is that for, I can, I can deliver what we're talking about here in, in the next few weeks to any of your clients subject to calendar constraints. The lead time on what we're talking about is, is not long. So if you find what we're talking about this morning compelling, uh, we can deliver this feed relatively quickly to you. For everybody on this call, I'm gonna offer a predictive index behavioral assessment, and that's complimentary. That's an online test that you take. Robert talked about it a minute ago. It's an online test you take. It takes about 10 minutes and it gives you some pretty uh, amazing insights into yourself. So everybody gets that free. For those of you who are executive coaches or in leadership development positions, if you have a C-level client, I'm offering a, an assessment for them and a one-on-one -on -one session where we do a personal readback for them and it takes about a half an hour and gives them a lot of insights into themselves and where they fit in their teams. And that's complimentary. For those of you who work with CEOs, uh, we have a tool that you'll see demonstrated this morning. It's a leadership team assessment. And if you work with CEOs, I'm willing to do a, a leadership team assessment for your CEO client complimentary. And that's a way that could add value to you just as it's that value to Rip's uh, practice as we'll hear in a few minutes. And last of all, for you, if anything that we do today results in a, in a contract and what we call a client agreement for predictive index, I'm also offering client fees. So let's jump into uh, the case study. Um, Rip, do you want to share? I'm going to stop my my uh, my slides. Rip, do you want to give us just a, a quick uh, description of your coaching business? Happy to do that, and good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be uh, back on a Beacon call. I was a member of Beacon and its predecessor organization, GPSEG, for a long time. I now live in Louisville, Kentucky, but I've continued to uh, consult with clients all over the country. One part of my consulting practice is uh, leadership coaching with uh, senior executives of entrepreneurial companies and larger uh, corporations around the country and nonprofits. Um, so what we, we, we do what you would all understand, I know, as straightforward executive coaching for leaders who want to improve. And it's in that context that Mark and I were chatting about a particular uh, client situation that I have with a woman COO of a rather large property management co company based here in Louisville, but they have uh, 
properties they manage coast to coast. Now, and she's when, new in that role. So we thought predictive index could be very helpful. Now, Rep, I did a, a read back for your client. And what value did your client get out of it? Well, first of all, insights. This is a woman who has had leadership responsibilities at lower levels of organizations earlier in her career, but not anything coming close to the seat she's now in. And uh, we both wanted to get some insights into her strengths and areas for development. We got that from the predictive index profile. We also got a great readout of management uh, tips for helping her maximize her effectiveness. That really has become the playbook for us in our coaching discussions. I really like the robust nature of the predictive index tool set because it makes it very easy for us to structure our conversations to focus on areas that showed through very quickly in her uh, profile or in predictive index profile. And we were able to use that as a, as a pathway for our coaching discussions. So insights, guidance on, on what to work on, and then some specific tips on thing, things we can address and ways we can go about addressing them to help her effectiveness. So it, it helped your, or I guess I should say, how did it help your coaching uh, abilities? Uh, focus, gave us, gave us focus right away. Uh, yeah. In a number of coaching situations that I've had in the past, it has taken us a while by virtue of feedback from others, other profiling tools, and our ongoing discussions to determine the most the, the best pathway to focus our coaching discussions to help my coaching clients be effective. This really accelerated that. Uh, predictive index it, it provides a lot of great insight. And so we could move through what would have been typically two or three coaching sessions in one session. Um, and when we uh, produced the profile, when Mark produced the profile, Mark and I sat down electronically with my client and went through it. And it really helped us cut to the chase. I think that's probably the best way to put it, Mark. Good, good. Okay. Now, Rip, I know that uh, over in your practice, you've worked with other assessment tools. How does predictive index compare to other assessment tools that you're familiar with? I think it's more actionable. Um, uh, we've used DISC and we've used uh, Colby and we've used a number of other tools over the years uh, quite often. And they're good. They're insightful. I like them. But I love predictive index because it's, it, it really is very well designed to be actionable with clients right away, which is why we were able to accelerate the pace of our discussions, our coaching discussions, and get focused on what her needs are much more quickly. So I think it's, I, I, I just, I, I appreciate the work the Predictive Index organization has done to develop an, an increasingly robust tool set. Um, and I wasn't a, a especially familiar with Predictive Index until just a few years ago, but I got much more familiar with it as you and I talked about it, Mark, and it's, it's helped a lot. Now I've got a number of clients that just rave about it. Great, excellent, Rip, thanks a lot for that, I appreciate it. Sure. I moved you up on the agenda because I know you've got a hard stop. You're welcome to stay uh, and listen or thanks. if you need to go, you can go, but thanks. I'll do that and duck out when I have to, but thanks a lot. No, thank you. Okay, let me go back to my slides here. Um... Hey, hey, Mark. Yes. Mark, it's Raj. Just, just as you're as you're flipping slides and transitioning, um, thank you for your generous offer on the on the first uh, slide. So, so I'm not in a coaching business, but I do have a bunch of clients that, uh, let me say, are growing and scaling and changing their leadership teams and going through a lot of the pains that you can you can imagine. Um, how do what are the what are the uh, signposts that say that somebody or a particular team is a good fit for this? Because as you're talking, then I'll be able to think about who might I want to introduce this to out of my client base. Because I'm not in a coaching capacity, right? But I do have, I don't know, some sort of say in terms of how their leadership teams are forming. I'm a trusted, you know, advisor, that type of thing. The, the real sweet spot for this is anybody who's, who's interested in developing a people strategy that aligns with their business strategy, as we say. So it, it's applicable for leadership teams, it's applicable for individual contributors. Um, it's applicable basically across the spectrum of employees in terms of company size, um, probably 30, 30 employees and up. Uh, it would work for smaller companies. 
the economics may not work out for smaller companies, but kind of 30 employees and up. Great, thank you. Think about. Okay, so again, my, here we go. So just uh, some background to give you some context. Predictive index is a thing that's been around for over 60 years. Uh, it operates globally. We have uh, over 8,000 now clients using it around the world, and we do 3 million assessments per year. And this is, I think, the most important data point on this slide. Uh, an individual assessment or behavioral assessments, we call them. We do over 3 million of those a year. Um, I work for a company called PI Atlantic. Predictive Index is sold and supported through partners. And I work for a partner called PI Atlantic. We are uh, based in Annapolis, Maryland. We have about 24 employees and uh, we're the largest PI partner in the world. So I give you this just to, so that you know, this has been around for a while and it's been vetted. And one of the most compelling data points about Predictive Index, I think, is our, is our renewal rate. Clients subscribe on an annual basis. So every year they have the opportunity to, to, re, to resubscribe or to cancel. And our renewal rate runs about 85 or 86%. So I think that says a lot about the platform and the value that it provides. So how do companies use it? Well, they use it primarily, our sweet spot is for hiring talent, for doing assessments of individuals and matching them to jobs. We do employee engagement, we measure employee engagement. We, we have tools that we call Inspire, which is to help manage careers and manage, manage train managers to manage better. It's used to build high-performing teams, and I'll demonstrate that for you shortly. We use it to leverage what we call people data to identify leaders. And basically what it's all about is creating self-awareness, self-awareness for individuals, how I act, what my drives are, and how I act with my colleagues in the workplace. So that, in a, in a nutshell, is, is what predictive index is used for by clients. And it's all based on a model that people have drives, and those drives create needs, and those needs create behaviors. And in the workplace, you can observe this, you can observe behaviors, but without people data, you're just guessing at needs and you're just guessing at drives. So what predictive index does is that it uncovers the drives and the needs that people have that explain their behaviors and gives you a lot of insight into the way people behave. And it's done by measuring drives and the four drives. The first drive that we call drive A is dominance, which is the drive to exert your influence on people or events. The second drive we measure is extroversion. Are you basically introverted or extroverted? extroverted? Uh, what's your drive for social interaction with other people? The third drive is patience or sense of urgency. Do you have a drive to, to get things done in, in, in a hurry or are you more patient? And the last one is, the, is formality, which is the drive to conform to rules and structures. Do you need rules and structures or do you think rules and structures are primarily for other people and don't apply to you? It's important to understand predictive index does not measure what you can and cannot do. It measures your drives. It measures what your natural drives are. Just like you sign your signature with your dominant hand, you can sign your signature with your non-dominant hand, but it's hard. It takes energy and it takes work. So a good example is how many people on this call consider yourself detail-oriented? Raise your hand if you consider yourself detail-oriented. Okay. Can you say that word again, please? What, now, are you, do you consider yourself detail-oriented? Detail-oriented. Okay. Now, if you're not detail-oriented, if, if you are detail-oriented, can you at times uh, become big picture and kind of let the details go? Do you have that flexibility? Can you do it if the situation calls for it? Yeah. But it takes, Rich is not on his head, but it takes, it takes work. It takes energy, right, Rich? Yeah. It's self-awareness is the first step, and then uh, you, you have to take corrective actions to, right. to change your basic behavioral style. So it doesn't measure what you can and can't do. It measures what you drive. So what you learn from a predictive index assessment is your communication style, your management style, how comfortable you are delegating your decision-making style and your response to change. So we're gonna that now switch and go actually into a, a, feed, a readback session with Rich Richardson. And Rich, thanks again for opening uh, up to us. Appreciate that. Rick took, or Rich took the assessment a little while ago. And we're gonna go over five documents, his, his behavioral assessment, his person snapshot, his personal development chart, uh, a relationship guide, and Rich, this is a new one on you. I haven't, uh, we didn't go over this one, and a coaching guide. 
So these are documents that are pretty detailed. So we won't go over all the details on these documents this morning because it would take a couple of hours, but we'll, we'll hit the, the high points so you get a feel for, for the utility and the value that, that each report adds. And you can, it, you can ask questions along the way. So Rich, you took the assessment. What's your, uh, and you, you did the read back. Can you describe sort of your reaction to it and how, how the platform assessed you? Sure. Um, well, as several people have said already, you know, over the years, uh, I've taken a variety of behavioral assessments, uh, DISC and Myers-Briggs and those types of things. So there weren't any huge surprises in the readback. It, it was confirming in nature in large part. Uh, but uh, I think maybe it was uh, Rip that said it. Uh, the, the, the further documents that will get to the actionable nature of this particular assessment is really what I like. So I didn't discover anything that I really kind of didn't know about myself in terms of these four big buckets, uh, but the, the underlying approach in terms of how to make changes is really what I found interesting. Great, thanks. So this is the beginning of the behavioral assessment. The behavioral assessment is about, three, about a three or four page document and it starts with a graph. And what this graph does is that it compares your drives, Rich, to the population as a whole. You are what we call a strategist, and a strategist is somebody who's results-oriented, you're innovative and you're analytical, but you've got to drive for a change. Now, the way you read this graph, is, as I say, this compares you with, with the population as a whole. Basically, what you're looking at is a statistical uh, standard distribution. The middle of the line here, the middle of the, of the chart here is the, uh, is, the, is the human population as a whole. There's a little, black triangle you can see. And if your drive is to the right of this, it's said to be high. And if it's to the left of this, it's said to be low. That's relative to the population as a whole. So your strongest drive is an A drive. Your, each of these, uh, I hope you can see these gray lines are kind of hard to see, they're kind of light. But each of these drives represents a standard deviation. So your A drive is pretty strong. A drive is the drive for independence. So you're about a standard deviation and a half standard deviation and a half higher than, than the population. Your B drive is to the left of the, of the mean, so your B drive is said to be low. That's about a half a standard deviation low, so not, not hugely different. Your C drive is fairly low. C drive is, is, your, is your sense of impatience. You have a very, you have a pretty high sense of impatience, a high sense of urgency. And your D drive, which is the drive to conform to rules and structure, is pretty much on the median population. You're slightly high, but you're, you're what we call situational, not a real strong drive for you. So what's two takeaways from this? One, how you compare to the population as a whole, and you are much more independent and much more driving than the population as a whole. But these factors also interact with each other. Um, your A drive and your C drive are your strongest drive. So when you're very, what we call A over C, that means you're very proactive. Um, you like to take the initiative. There's also a big difference between your A and your B drive. What does that mean? That means that you're very task-oriented as opposed to people-oriented. Not good or bad to be tasked with people and This is just descriptive of who you are. And lastly, there's a pretty big difference between your A and your D drives and when you're, a, when you're what we call A over D. You're pretty comfortable with risk. You are not risk averse. You're, you're willing to, to take those on. Now, when you think about you in the workplace, sort of how does this show up? Can you give us an example of you being, you know, proactive or task oriented or, or comfortable with risk? Well, I've spent the last uh, 17 years engaging uh, Fortune 500 organizations and trying to uh, persuade them to change and to move in a certain direction. And so uh, I, I've become adept at uh, being impatient. I live in the future in, in large part in terms of trying to drag industry with me to, to move forward and digitize their operations. So that, that impatience is certainly something that I recognize and appreciate. And the independent versus collaborative, uh, I was initially concerned because I consider myself to be a strong collaborator, but as I uh, uh, talked to Mark about it, what that basically uh, helped me understand was I'm typically the team leader. So I, I'm not collaborating, I'm driving. And so that independence 
shows up as someone who pull a team together, you know, drop the, the plan on the table and say, this is what we need to do, and then say, let's go. And that impatience and that independence, I think, uh, are, are strong personality traits that I have and I've had, had to have to succeed. Great. Okay. Thanks. Now, the behavioral assessment also uh, includes, it's, it's much more than this graph. As I said, it's about a three or four page document. And my offer stands, what I said earlier, if any of you want a behavioral assessment done, let me know. But it includes text, three or four pages of text that, that describes, excuse me, your strongest behaviors, your management style, your influencing style, and your management strategy. So I will, I will provide that for each of you if you're interested. The second person, the second document that we want to look at is what we call the person snapshot. And the person snapshot introduces needs. I talked earlier about the model is the, the platform is based on people have needs that drives, that creates uh, behaviors and that creates needs and behaviors. So the person snapshot introduces two things. It introduces a video that you can watch on what being in Rich's case, a strategist is, but it also introduces uh, needs. So, and it does so in plain English. That's one of the other things that I like about this, uh, this particular report. So we saw earlier, Rich, that you have a very high A drive, which means you're very independent and assertive. So what are some of the needs that come out of that? You may need lots of independence. You may need to control your own activities and you definitely need to be challenged. We saw that you have a, um, a moderately high a B drive, which means you're moderately introspective. You're sort of matter of fact and you're, you're analytical. What does that mean in terms of needs? Well, you need some opportunities to reflect. You need room for introspection and you need freedom from office politics, which you told me the other day is definitely true for you, right? Right. Um, we saw you have a pretty low C drive. That means you have a high sense of urgency. So you're pretty intense and you're pretty restless. What does that mean in terms of needs? Well, you're gonna need variety and opportunities to work at a pretty fast pace and you like mobility as well. A, a nine to five job, heads down in the cubicle wouldn't work for you. And lastly, we saw your, your D drive, um, which is conforming to rules and structure. It's kind of situational. You're pretty close to the population in there. So what that means is that you're, you're moderately informal, you're moderately tolerant of uncertainty, and you're moderately reserved and flexible. The needs that come out of that is you need a balance of understanding the rules and regulations. You need specific knowledge of the job and you need freedom from risk of error. And you do like to delegate details. Now, how does all this show up in the workplace? Well, at work, your colleagues are gonna see you as proactive, which we talked about, and as pretty task-oriented. So that's what the person snapshot introduces, needs and how you show up at work. The real meat of this uh, chart, the real meat of this uh, assessment though, is the personal development chart. And a lot of my clients really like this. We take each of the drives and we analyze what some of your strengths are, what some of your caution areas are. The caution areas are problematic only if you don't understand them. So this gives you some insight and some caution areas and some self-coaching tips. So as we saw before, you have a very high A drive. So that's a drive to be independent as opposed to more team-oriented. Some strengths that come out of that, you need to drive change and you like to, to challenge the status quo. You seek to have an impact on things and you're innovative and you're able to think big picture. Some caution areas for people who have that, that high A drive, sometimes you could be seen as overly aggressive and you might intimidate some people. Uh, you may be tough-minded and you may have difficulty delegating authority. But the really useful thing here, I think, are, are the self-coaching tips. So what we're suggesting to you is that you should actively seek input from multiple sources. You should practice active listening and let other people express their ideas and opinions. And think before you speak, think how your message might be, might be received by others. Looking at the B drive, we saw that's moderately low. Some strengths of people with low B drives is that you're, you're a creative problem solver, you're data-driven, you're analytical, you're thoughtful in your approach to communication, you're reflective and you anticipate problems. Some caution areas there, you may be slow to trust, you may, communication may be pointed or kind of minimal and people might wonder why is he communicating that way? And you may appear to be overly task oriented or focused on or, or sometimes be sometimes seen as remote. Some self-coaching tips, take your area of expertise and give some presentations of them. 
uh, initiate conversations or schedule times to, to speak with others, especially those who are, who are much more uh, extroverted than you and create processes that encourage communications. So that's the B drive. The personal development chart then goes through the C and the D drives, but in the interest of time, uh, we're, I'm gonna skip those because um, we have an awful lot to cover yet. And I think that's, that gives you a, a, a sense for what the personal development chart does. The next tool that I'd like to introduce is the relationship guide. And clients use this to look at how two people will work together. And as an example, I'm just, I'm just using Rich and myself as an example. As you can see, we have very different patterns. Rich is a strategist and I'm a guardian. And there's some big differences. He's got a pretty high A drive. I've got a pretty low A drive. Um, he has a pretty low C drive. C drive is a sense of, of urgency. And uh, I have a pretty high one. So which means I'm more patient than, uh, than I am urgent. Excuse me, something popped up there. So, Mark, is there, yeah. sorry, if you were doing this for a team, would all of the team members, let's say they're five or six, would they all appear in this or is it only two people at a time? Great question, Charlie. It's only two people at a time, but I'll show you another tool in a minute that looks at the team. Thanks. Okay, great question. So what the relationship guide does is it looks at the, the relationship strengths, some caution areas for this relationship and some tips. For example, relationship strengths. Uh, Rich and Mark can, Rich can help Mark by supporting their ideas and create a, a unified front. Rich and Mark communicate efficiently and quickly get to the point. Uh, I'm able to encourage and act as a counterbalance when Rich feels frustrated. frustrated. And you can read the rest of those. Some caution uh, areas in our relationship uh, Rich may dominate the agenda. Um, that's his low C and his high A. And my, my ideas might get overlooked. Um, we both may be reserved or hesitant to begin a conversation uh, on our own initiative. And communication between them may, be, may falter if we become too focused on our individual work. So we give some relationship tips here. Whoops. Give some relationship tips here. Rich may be the ones who tends to set the agenda, but Rich should make sure that Mark uh, has his say. Rich and Mark should remember to periodically check that they're learning from each other and listening to each other. So we have a few more relationship uh, tips here and, and I can give you uh, examples uh, if you'd like uh, after the call. The next document is the coaching guide and the coaching guide um, compares an individual with a job. We've seen individual patterns and this is Rich's pattern. One of the ways that the, the predictive index platform is used is to compare an individual with a job. And we set what we call job targets. Job targets are we want people to fall, their, their drives to fall within a certain range. And this is a comparison of Rich with a, a chief operating officer role. And as you can see, he's a really good fit for this role. All four of his drives fall nicely within the range that have been established for a, for a COO. What this coaching guide does is that it introduces some coaching questions. Uh, and I know that Rip Tilden looked at this and found this to be very, very valuable in working with his clients. So, whoops, so we give you coaching questions based on each of the drives. Example, the A drive, how can you leverage your ability to take charge and lead a team? How could, what could you do to take advantage of your natural, uh, natural tendency to be proactive? Looking at the B drive, how could you improve your performance during periods when you're working alone? In what ways could you maximize your ability to be analytical when examining, examining problems, et cetera? And I think it's, it's a tool like this. Rich or Rip mentioned earlier that one of, the, one of the things that PI did for him as a coach is it helped him cut to the chase and uncover issues um, and get to the, the, the meat of the situation quicker. And I think it's because one of the reasons is because of this coaching done. It gives, you, it gives you tailored questions based on that individual and that job. So I'm gonna repeat my offer to you. Um, for you, I'm offering you a complimentary assessment. For your C-level client, uh, a read back, uh, and that's complimentary. And it would be much longer than what we just did because we're, we're short on time today. If you work with CEOs, uh, I will do a leadership team assessment for them. And I'm gonna show you that tool in a minute and for you any finders fees. So before I switch and go to the team assessment, let me take questions. Did I hear you say that you can use this in the hiring process 
And just as an extension of that, I've used DISC in the past. And I understand that's not one you're allowed to use in the hiring process. So if I have the story straight, Mark, why can you use this and you can't use DISC? This is designed for hiring. It's really our sweet spot. Um, as you saw briefly in the coaching guide, the comparison between rich and a job target. Um, this is how clients use this. They give it to candidates. And Robert mentioned earlier, he took it last week. He's a candidate for, for a job. So it's, it's used to compare an individual with a job target. And it, it very, very quickly uh, lets you develop a short, uh, a short list of candidates that you want to interview. Why is DISC not used in, in hiring? I really can't answer that. Don't know that but, but hey, Mark, is, can, I, can I jump in with a quick example for, sure. for you, Charlie, Please. on using it in a hiring situation? This is a client several years back um, for whom we use the predictive index for a, a senior individual contributor sales seat. So not the okay. sales manager seat, but a very senior role as an individual salesperson. The predictive index said, this individual will be phenomenal at opening doors and horrible at closing. Yeah. And, and it was really clear. We ignored it, hired the person anyway. Guess what? He was <laughs> phenomenal at opening doors and he couldn't close anything. And we yeah. ultimately realized we either had to backstop him with somebody who was a great closer or listen to predictive index originally. <laughs> Yeah. So it was really fascinating to see it come to life in practical, real terms. Got it. Got it. My, my question is, uh, and we don't, we can move on, but my question is, I, I guess from a legality standpoint, some of these assessments are legal to use in the hiring process. Others aren't because they're considered discriminatory. I think DISC is that way. It sounds like this one is not. And I was just interested in the nuances between the two, but that may be for another, uh, another time, Mark. Yeah the, short, um, yeah, the short answer is this is not considered discriminatory. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. It, it introduces a data-driven construct that eliminates subjectivity and uh, bias. Okay. A question Good. on a follow-up on that. How are the targets set? Is that collaboration with the hiring manager in your case is RIP or are there standards? And how does it cover all the jobs? There's, I'll take that, Bob. There's two ways. We have a database of about 7,000. And if you want to hire, say, an outside salesperson, we have a job to target there. You can use that. You can use the one that we have. Or if you don't like it, for whatever reason, we have a survey that you can send out to stakeholders, people who are knowledgeable about the job, and they can fill out this questionnaire and it develops a target that, that is tailored to what that client wants. Okay, thanks. I, the reason I ask is my client was that kind of the nonprofit that working with autistic clients are and I suspect that there might not be one even in the 7,000. I was just curious, but that's what they used and they, they had fabulous results by using that in their hiring process. They had a great team. Good, yeah, two ways to do it. One that's canned, one that's developed. Okay. Hey Mark, Tom Donahue. Hi Tom. Um, one question, do you see a lot of variability or any variability over time if someone's taken it two, three years ago and then retakes the assessment? Great question. The answer is no. Um, these, the, what we call the self graph, which is what you saw, changes very little over an adult's life. The two other graphs that we didn't get into that do change and can change in the situation. But the, the self graph, which is the, the basis of the, of the behavioral assessment, changes very little over an adult's life. Well, I, I would add just a, a point to that. Like I said, I've taken several assessments and it's critically important that whoever's taking the assessment understands uh, what Mark said at the outset. There aren't any good or bad answers. And so to be brutally honest with yourself when you're answering the questions it is the key to getting the right answers so that you can work on the things you really need to work on. Let me ask you a question about that, Mark. So if, so if I'm hiring somebody and... Um, they think they know what I'm looking for, and then they therefore not manipulate because people are probably aren't that smart in it. When and these are probably pretty sophisticated, you know, some of these are beyond people's ability to manipulate. But you know, if I was asking an introvert or an extrovert question to a salesperson, and that person could be an introvert, but they might answer it a different way to try to get the job. So, Rich, you're, you're right, people should do it a certain way, but if you're trying to get a job and this is a uh, a known tool to decide whether I'm going to hire or not. How do you prevent people from sort of manipulating the answers? 
No, that's a great question. And the answer is the, the, the test itself is just a list of adjectives that you select. You, you, you select or you don't select an adjective that describes you. And if a candidate doesn't really know what the job target is, which the candidate wouldn't, the candidate can't really know what the right or wrong answer is because all you're doing is selecting uh, adjectives that, that describe you. Um, and so it, it's very difficult for a candidate to say, okay, I know what the pattern is. I know what words to check so I fit the pattern. It, it, it's just not an issue. All right, I, I do wanna take other questions, but it's very important that we switch gears here. I wanna show you the team tool that came, that question came up a moment ago. So let me switch here and go to, this is where we're doing a lot of work these days and we're getting a lot of traction in the market with this. This is a team, we call this discover your team type. And this gives you insights into how teams work. And what you're looking at here is what we call the work styles uh, grid or the work styles uh, circle. And work can be divided into, into four areas, uh, innovation and agility. And innovation and agility, people who fall into this category, team members tend to focus on pursuing in, new innovations. They tend to be open to risk and experimentation. They prefer to act, quick, act quickly and assertively. A second area uh, of how work is done is result, what we call results and discipline. And team members in this area tend to focus on results and goal achievement. They tend to be driven. They tend to be competitive. They make decisions independently and they resolve conflict by, by focusing on the task as opposed to people. The third area um, is what we call process and precision. And in this area, team members tend to focus on process and predictability. They prefer analytical decision-making. They like concise communication uh, and they make decisions collaboratively, collaboratively seeking input from each team member involved. And the fourth area is teamwork and employee experience. And in this area, team members tend to focus on collaboration. They tend to focus on relationship building. They tend to be socially, <clears throat> excuse me, socially and interpersonally sensitive, and they prefer to, to support others to grow and, and, and develop. And they resolve conflict by focusing on the people as opposed to the task. So let's take a look at a team. And this, by the way, is a fictitious team. And the head of this team is Rex Duffy. Where does Rex fall? Well, Rex falls into the results and discipline category. Now, Rex is what we call a guardian. And a guardian is an unselfish and approachable person with a preference for detailed skill-based work. What Rex brings to the team is he encourages responsible action. He is thoughtful uh, when communicating, he pays close attention to detail, and he has strong discipline and execution. His preferred work style is that he's careful with rules and precise, he's detail-oriented, and he's formal and reserved. He's got a couple of blind spots, as we all do. And as I said earlier, blind spots are problematic only if you don't understand them. And his blind spots are he may be sensitive to criticism, and may want to avoid conflict, and may struggle in ambiguous situations. So let's add a few more members on the team here. Uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel is an, ad, an adapter. An adapter is a bridge builder. His, what he brings to the table is he takes charge in ambiguous situations. He personally is flexible and empathetic, and he's a bridge builder. Some blind spots may be hard to read and would benefit from communication, their thinking to mitigate uncertainty. We'll add a few more people to the team. Here's Charles. Here's Mui. Now, Mui is a very different person. Mui is an, an altruist. An altruist is congenial and cooperative. What he brings to the table is that he drives change and execution. He builds team cohesion. Cohesion, sorry. He's organized and has thorough follow-up, and he's a multitasker, able to, to judge priorities. Likewise, uh, he's got a preferred work style and some potential blind spots. So you can go through here and add all the members of a team and look at how the team as a whole performs. And as you can see, this team is pretty well populated with people who are oriented towards innovation and agility. That's their natural drives. People who are oriented towards results and discipline. That's their natural drives and that's where the team leader falls and uh, one person who's oriented towards process and precision. Now there's an obvious gap with this team and that is a teamwork and employee experience. 
So if I were working with this team, I would ask them, you know, how does this show up in work? How is how would you describe your employee engagement? This is a leadership team, and nobody is really looking at the employee experience. How do you measure employee experience when you roll things out? Uh, how do how do employees accept it? What's your adaptation rate of new innovations, et cetera? I'd, I'd probe a little bit on this gap. And one of the ways that this team, that this tool is used is to look at gaps that teams have. And you can either say, you live with that gap, or um, we, want to, we want to bring somebody on the team who's more oriented towards teamwork and employee experience. Mark, it also applies to or organizations, and I don't know if you're going to go there or not, but uh, by doing a similar assessment, uh, we found as an organization that we, we were very much on the right-hand side of this uh, uh, graphic. And so we were very task-oriented, get the job done no matter what. Uh, and that top left corner, that teamwork element, it is a critical uh, part of succeeding in the long term. You can be task oriented in the short term and get stuff done and be kind of quarter minded, if you will, uh, in terms of a business. But if, if you don't put processes in place and if you don't uh, think about the teamwork aspect of things, it's going to be short term in nature. It's going to be a lot of churn. Yep. Yep. Thanks for that, Rich. I was working with one client, one leadership team, and they all fell in the innovation and agility quadrant. They had nobody who fell on the process and precision. And that was great insight for them because now they figured out that's why we can't get anything done. We have all these great ideas, but nobody puts the, the, the steps and the process in place for execution. Well, so, having worked with Amazon and Google and a lot of Silicon Valley companies, that top right quadrant is how a lot of the development teams look but they have to have somebody that pulls them back down to the ground and says, we, we need a plan, right? So. All right, you're exactly right. Now what this tool does is that, it, is that it shows individual strengths and we have an activity that we can do, team building activities that will, that will help the team members understand the individual strengths and how to work with uh, people in their other quadrants and a, a tool of, sorry, a team activity that lets you uh, learn how to recognize overlapping styles and, and build relations, strengths and strengthen relationships in the team, excuse me. Now, we also have developed, just as we have a topology for individuals, we have a topology for a team. And this team is what we call a producing team. And a producing is competitive, intense, and they're task-oriented. And we give the, the team a, tech, a description of them. They're task-oriented with their eye on the prize. Cooperation with others isn't really emphasized. You tend to work together when it helps you reach your goals, uh, but it has to be a win-win. We then give the team, just as we did with individuals, we then give the team strengths. We give them some potential blind spots, an example of strength. Uh, you know what to do to produce high quality work quickly for your clients. Some blind spots, you drive to stay on top and keep raising the bar, it can lead to, to burnout. Too much competition may cause unhealthy rivalries. And we also then give the team a team building activity uh, to build on their strengths and to address their, their blind spots. We then give them a report, uh, some recommendations on how they, things they can do to uh, improve communication, things they can do to uh, resolve conflicts and things they can do to minimize employee burnout. So this is the team work styles uh, tool that um, is designed for really teams of any types. Um, I made an offer earlier to say, I will work with any of your CEO clients at no charge to develop a team assessment for the leadership team and the client organization. So I know that's really high level um, and really fast. So let me stop and take questions or comments. The, the one thing I wanna add, and then I'll stop talking and I'll let you guys who are, uh deeply interested in this topic, um, ask questions. But the thing that I talked to Mark about is the fact that uh, I got these uh, this assessment, uh, which is very actionable, late in my career. I wasn't familiar with PI uh, more before about a year ago. And the, the action steps that it gives you and the way to think about how to uh, be more self-aware and how to move forward. If I'd had this assessment much earlier in my career, I think I would have been a more effective uh, employer and, and probably 
personally more successful. So uh, in spite of whatever relative success I had, I think that I could have done better uh, knowing more about myself and the steps to uh, to make up for my blind spots early on. So uh, I, I think companies are starting to recognize the benefits. Again, in Silicon Valley, when I talk to those folks, they know they have to add different types of people to their teams so that the team can succeed as a whole. Thanks, I have the same thought, Rich. I can imagine every team I worked on would have benefited from this. Good. Other other questions or comments? Give me a sense, if you would, when you're working with a team, the amount of time you have to invest uh, with that particular team uh, to get the kind of results that are possible. Um, the behavioral assessment takes each individual about 10 minutes. We do a workshop with each team, Charlie, that takes about two hours. And there's actually two parts to it. If you do the second part, it can take four hours. Uh, and that includes the, the team building activities. Um, we then, uh, that usually gets them going. If they want to follow up workshop in another six or eight months, we can do it, do it again. So the time commitment is either two or four hours to the team. Again, speaking personally, I'd suggest that uh, second check-in would be a critical aspect. You know, how much have we changed? What results are we seeing? Uh, would be a really critical implementation step moving forward. Great. Other questions, comments? Yeah, yeah Mark, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, again, and you're very upfront, you were very generous as to offer this to us. That's, that's awesome. I'm thinking about my clients, just like probably most of the people on the phone are. Uh, and you mentioned that it might be cost prohibitive for organizations that are too small. What's the magnitude of budget that they would have to set aside for something like this? I don't know, a leadership team of five, let's say for a you know small to medium sized business like I deal with. Um, the way predictive index is sold, as I said earlier, is on an annual license. Right. And an inexpensive license is about $8,000. That would be a license for one year. An expensive license for a large company, lots of employees would be twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars for a year. And that's uh, and that license is for the company, and that's for the leadership team and the employees. Like, tell me what that gets me. It gets you uh, a, a certain number of assessments. It's really based on the number of employees. It gets you a certain number of assessments um, for and, and the and the and the, the team tools. So it gets you basically an unlimited number of assessments for uh, candidates. It gives you a certain number of assessments for employees and then access to the team tools. The license cost is a function of the, we have four different layers, four different kinds of services uh, and, and, and number of employees. So, but the, the minimum ticket to entry is probably about $8,000. Just thinking about that in the real world, even if it's just used for hiring, you make one bad hiring decision. It's more than paid for it. I mean, forget everything else. Just that one bad decision. Hundred percent, Bob. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. So, so everything should be in terms of. I talk in ROI to my clients all the time, and so an eight thousand dollar investment for a smaller, medium sized business, yeah, it may feel expensive, but at the end of the day, what's the cost of one bad hire, which I can show almost all my clients have made in the last year. Yeah, the the cost of a bad hire for uh, an individual contributor is typically about 30 or 40% of annual compensation. The cost of a bad hire at the executive level is a multiple of annual compensation. So the ROI is, is typically very, very good with predictive index, which is why our renewal rate is about 86%. Mark, we have about five minutes left. Mark, Mark, it's Bob King. I've got one comment and one question and maybe a little bit out of left field. The comment is if you've got that higher retention rate and it's that valuable tool, I'm wondering whether your pricing might be a little bit lower. You might want to structure your pricing in a way to allow you to, to do a little bit better. And, and the, the comment in the left field is, I took the test last week. At that point, I was still in the midst of, of interviewing. I got word on Friday they're going to be extending an offer to me. So we're so the, the, the conversation is about to shift. I'm getting my, my verbal offer in a couple hours. I expect to get my written offer probably tonight or tomorrow. Congratulations, Bob. Well, congratulations. That's great. I mean, but 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 here, but here when I when I speak to the, the woman at HR today, I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna mention I had this meeting today. I said I'm curious, would she be willing to provide me with my results? 
And so really there's no reason for her not to. I'm assuming I'll get at least something out of her. And so I, I want to turn the tables because we're about to go into negotiation. So I'm wondering if you were in my shoes, how could I use the information to, to figure out the best? What, what, what would you look at if you were in my shoes to figure out the best way to, to structure the conversation to, to potentially give me uh, a little bit more than I might otherwise get? I would use it to reinforce your strength and say, look, you're looking for somebody who is, has the following characteristics and the predictive index tool has shown you that I in fact am, you know, a big picture guy or a, a detailed oriented person, or I, you know, I don't know what role you're looking for, mm -hmm. but use it to reinforce their decision to make you an offer and say, you know, this is why you're doing it. And this is why I'm really a good fit for this role. And by the way, I'm worth 20% more than what you're offering me. Thank you, Mark. And, and to your earlier point about the, the ROI, yeah, Raj, I just doubled the prices. So it's now $16,000. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. You're, you're, you're a tough cookie. <laughs> Other questions, comments? So I, I, want to hear, I want to hear from the people as to their reaction to today's session. What did they get out of it that was beneficial to them? And, and just shout out. Well, I'll throw it out there. I took the assessment late last week. I haven't got my results yet. Mark and I meet on Wednesday. So it really, this has been fantastic for me to really kind of go into that conversation, already understanding the framework and the, uh, the outputs, and I'll be able to really focus in on the content and what Mark is sharing with me. And then to, to put me behind what a client told me, and now it's easy to recommend this, knowing more about it, particularly for the consulting business I'm in. And, and for me, it was it was backwards. Of course, I, I took it last week, and I, you know, it, it took me less than five minutes to do the thing. I, and I, so I'm wondering in the back of my head, just just how much value is this thing at all? But seeing seeing what you had there sort of puts it in context and makes it a little, very interesting. Good. Now, I would like to ask uh, if you could put in the chat room. If you'd like to take advantage of any, any of my four-part offer, just say, I'd like to have a, a follow-up meeting. Just put that in the chat room and I'll schedule that with you. Charlie Timmons, I've got a question for you. Have you begun seeing, um, maybe I'm just late to the party, but I deal with a lot of people who are in transition at a high level within pharma. Have you begun seeing people put results from things like PI or DISC on their resumes? I think uh, the language that PI provides, their description of you and the value that you can deliver, a lot of that information you can just lift out and then you know personalize it, but you can incorporate that in your LinkedIn profile, in cover letters, in follow-up emails with people, a lot of great content that really explains who you are and what people can expect. Okay, so Raj wants to follow up. Bob, you do. Brian, you do. Happy to do that. Anybody else? I um, will. Bruce? Mark. Okay, yeah. Charlie, if you could, I want to capture yep. that. Just indicate that in the chat room. Yep. So what I'm taking away from this is the fact that um, I could recommend this tool to my clients, and that really enhances my preeminence in their minds as to the value that I can deliver, being in their world. It just reinforces the fact that Charlie's really looking out after our best interests. So that's, that's pretty powerful to have a yeah. tool that has this degree of certainty to it. Hey, Mark, have you ever paired up the results of yours with for those who are in the, in the market, thinking Bob King and your comment, Charlie, with job requirements to say, here, here's what the job requirements are. Am I a good fit or not? In other words, uh, for a CFO role, these are the types of profiles that are good fits. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Not really. We do that on an individual basis, but not sort of on a broader basis, which is I think what yeah. you're asking, so no. Thanks, just curious. I got to drop to another call. Thanks, this is fabulous. I'm glad I was here. Thank Take you, care, Bob. Bob. Thank you. Any final comments, Mark, before we go? No, I, I hope this was useful to you all. Thanks for joining. I, I appreciate it. Um, thank you. And Charlie, thanks for setting it up. My pleasure, Mark. Members, helping members.
Zoe, thank you for... Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the Mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org. Recording...